good mo good morning class and thank you very much uh, for uh, coming and today we are actually just um, going to give you uh, some exam based contact classes for 2022 uh, and that's actually a menu on natural science and health uh, too uh, my name is maria uh, shipandeni and if you have questions, uh, you can either email me to that email address that is actually indicated there, that is tauchiko at gmail.com. And you are also welcome to call me at the number indicated on the, on the slides, that is 081-2612-950. First of all, I would just like to highlight a few important notes, uh, which is actually based on the exams. And this is actually also just to help you with, uh, or to guide you with what is to expect in the exam. And also just to give you some of the hints uh, that you should take note of. First of all, I want you to pay attention to the learning outcomes of every unit of your study guide. For sure, you do have a study guide. And with your study guides, just uh, at each unit, at the beginning of each unit, you have learning outcomes. So when you are done with your unit, just try to see what is expected of you from uh, at the end of that unit. So try to uh, understand and be able to answer most of the questions that are indicated in each unit. And for the exams, I also uh, like to actually appeal to you to read the instructions and, uh, and questions carefully. There are times that students uh, don't actually uh, read questions very well, and hence uh, they are not answering questions as, as they are asked. So there are uh, broom taxonomy, uh, uh, broom that are actually used uh, when asked when questions uh, are actually uh, put up to students and you should be able to describe if you're asked to describe, explain if you're asked to explain. I mean, elaborate on your answers when you're asked to discuss, but not just to literally just mention some of the points that you want to put across, but you need to elaborate on your answers. And as a teacher, you should also use uh, practical examples uh, when necessary in order to strengthen uh, your answers. If you are asked some questions, you can actually uh, use examples and you should use practical examples that are actually useful and necessary to whatever you are asked and that will actually help you to um, strengthen your answers. And you should provide sufficient answers, as I said. Uh, don't write too little when you are asked a question that is maybe of 10 marks and you are writing as little as uh, an answer for or a question for two marks. Just try to elaborate, write as much as you can when, uh, I mean, based on the questions that is asked and the marks that are actually allocated to each of the question. And also, uh, I know my handwriting is also not as, as good, but try to write as neatly as possible because then sometimes it's very difficult to read some of the handwritings, but try to write as neatly as, as possible. And after all, I mean, overall, you need to prepare for the exam, uh, use a study guide, and ask questions here and there. If you need any help, you can reach out. I gave you my contact details, my e email address, as well as my phone number. You, you are welcome to contact me if you need any help with any of the units. Because as I'm going to present to you uh, uh, whatever I prepared in the slides, I won't be able to cover or the units uh, that are actually uh, available in your study guide. And uh, I'll actually just uh, highlight a few things that you actually need to pay attention to. So to start with, I want to start with uh, teaching and teaching strategies. Uh, with this, uh, there are actually different methods that can be used uh, uh, in uh, senior primary levels, and those are different teaching methods. So with these um, methods, you should be able to describe, describe the method, the teaching method, and you should also be able to discuss how you apply each of the methods in, 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 when teaching. You, so 
be able to describe the method and you should be able to discuss how you can apply the methods to execute this method successfully. So the commonly used teaching methods uh, may include presentation where you literally go to class and present uh, whatever you want to present, the topic for that day to, to your learners. And, and that is mainly more on teaching, just lecturing or just presenting your, 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 your unit or the subject that you want to cover that day. There is also uh, another uh, uh, method that is actually common, and that is actually demonstration. And demonstration actually involves performing uh, an activity so that uh, learners can observe how it's actually how it's done in order to prepare. Uh, this will actually help prepare learners to transfer theory to more practical application. And demonstrations are actually a good way because apart from just theory, you are also uh, showing them how the some of the things are reacting. For instance, if you go to the lab, and that is actually uh, very helpful. It's one of the uh, other uh, the teaching method that can be applied. So, and when you are executing this, you need to make sure that you'll be able to do whatever you want to do in, 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 in when you are demonstrating it. Should, so you have to make sure that you are demonstrating it uh, very well, that students will be able to pick up whatever uh, uh, message you want to put across. And you should uh, ca be careful when you are uh, planning your uh, demonstration. If you want to demonstrate on evaporation or if you want to demonstrate on photosynthesis, whatever topic you want to uh, demonstrate, just make sure that you plan your demonstration carefully. And if you need any tools, if you need any equipment, just make sure that you have those in place because then you don't want to run around looking for some of the materials uh, during the practical. I mean the demonstration. And also keep the demonstration simple and you need to explain uh, your theories throughout uh, the, the, the demonstration. And also you can use some of the visual aids if necessary just to strengthen your, 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 your demonstration. There is also another common method that is actually large group discussion, which is mainly based on uh, seeking uh, or information or stimulating thinking and elaboration from 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 uh, uh, learners. So with that, you you need to just uh, it's it's more like a, a question and answer session where you have to develop questions and whatever questions you are developing, you must make sure that they are actually related to your learning objectives because you want to discuss a certain topic and of course on that topic you have uh, uh, objectives that you want to achieve so we must make sure that your questions that you are actually asking they are actually related to your running objectives and then you can use open-ended questions um, and also have clear sequence of questions so if you want to uh, ask uh, uh, questions, there must be a clear sequence of what happens and then what happens after this happens. So you just have to make sure that uh, you, 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 you have a clear sequence of questions. For instance, for peer pressure, then you maybe have to first discuss or ask questions what the learners understand by the word peer pressure, and then you build on your questions as, as they go. So you must make sure that you have your questions, your questions are clearly uh, sequenced in such a manner. So, and then the other uh, methods or that can be used, the teaching method that they, they can actually be used is the, uh, you can also use uh, some uh, like role play games and self uh, awareness exercises. Like for instance, we give tests to students and that's also a very good teaching method. Instead of you just going to class and then stand there and pump all these theories or to students and what what you can also then have tests and exercises uh, regularly just to uh, uh, make your uh, teaching more interesting and to keep them thinking and you you know as a facilitator you want to interact with your your learners you want to have time and actually let them actually have that independent to take uh, their education seriously you need to work on that 
So, and apart from uh, teaching uh, methods and uh, teaching, uh, I also want to uh, talk about uh, support of learners with special needs. Uh, you know, life can actually be challenging for a learner with special needs. Uh, it might be harder for them to do normal stuff, like for instance, read, or it might be uh, difficult for a person who has physical handicap, like just to go around school or to go to the playground. So with that, um, we, we need to get involved. We need to encourage uh, these learners. We need to actually support them. And uh, how do we actually support the learners with special needs? So some of the uh, 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 ways we can actually uh, support learners with special need is actually just to work closely with uh, special education programs or departments that are in place and any other aided uh, uh, who might uh, work with with that learner so you need to understand what uh, type of uh, special need that the, the, the learner actually uh, need. And then you also need to read the individual education plan to learners uh, and understand what modification need to, to be made and talk to parents because parents have been with this learner for, for, for a long time so they need you need to talk to parents and learn actually what actually motivates that particular or specific learner. And you allow learner choices of activities and use brain-based uh, learning strategy that actually help them to think and stretch their minds. Allow them to, to think, allow them to have activities that actually stimulate their thinking. And uh, uh, you need to be uh, uh, eager, you need to be enthusiastic in, the, in your encouragement. Encourage them to do well, encourage them to take part in, uh, in activities. Just be supportive. And focus on learner's strength and support also, and also be supportive in, in their weaknesses. And uh, it's also very important to let each learner know that you believe in them, that you believe that they, they can succeed. Uh, a special need, uh, a special, all special need learners are capable of success. So you need to actually show them that you believe in them and that they, they you should encourage them to do well and be actually uh, supportive. So those are some of the ways in which uh, uh, teachers uh, can actually support learners uh, with uh, special need. So in, in that section, uh, in that unit, uh, or the, the point that we actually discussed, you may be able, you may be asked to actually describe you may be, like for instance, you are asked to describe a teaching method, a particular teaching method, or you are asked to to describe a teaching method of your choice, or you might be asked to explain how you can execute that uh, successfully. Apart from, you may just be uh, literally uh, asked to highlight or to list uh, some of the teaching methods uh, that can be imp uh, employed or uh, applied, or maybe just to discuss how learners uh, or teachers can actually support learners with special needs. And then I want uh, us again to discuss teaching sub, uh, strategies uh, that can actually promote deep learning. Um, in this uh, 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 topic, I want us actually to look at how teachers can actually promote deep learning in lessons. You know, as, as a teacher, you want to uh, encourage, to, to be, you, you know, when you are giving out a, a certain topic or when you go teach, you want to be interested, you want to show them that you are interested in your topic, you want to cultivate that interest, you want to make them uh, uh, eager and willing to learn, you want to also keep pace, so that, because sometimes learners can also just concentrate this much and then you want them to keep up with with with, with you throughout the throughout your session so you want them to be to be interested in your topic from the beginning to to the end so now is how uh, teachers can actually promote deep learning in class. So one of the points that you can use or how you can actually promote uh, deep learning in lessons is by encouraging uh, collaborations. Encourage collaborations, this actually just means like let the learners discuss in groups, let them present ideas, consider their 
their point of views and make decisions in order to increase their stake of their own learning. So you just want the learners to collaborate, put them in small groups and let them discuss and share their ideas and you listen to them when they're interacting and uh, also just uh, be uh, around, go around the class when they're in different groups. You want them to actually just uh, collaborate discuss uh, and then just share knowledge each and every person in the group must actually contribute to the to the discussion or to the uh, topic that is uh, they, are, they are actually discussing you also need to assess uh, learners informally so apart uh, from just uh, e or formal assessments you can also just uh, also uh, take advantages of opportunities uh, to use informal uh, assessment. So observe the, them, uh, have a conversation with the students, uh, interact with them. And also nowadays, uh, due to this pandemic, we, we, we are now also into o o online uh, um, learning platforms. So take advantages of online uh, learning platforms. Uh, there are so many of them that you can actually just uh, use to actually informally assess, assess your students. And also, uh, this can be also be promoted by designing lessons with a, a flexible learning path. The traditional way of, of teaching uh, should be actually, uh, you, you need to put that aside. Apart from the traditional way, you go to class and then that just teach. You need to also then uh, 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 make use of, of, of the of other resources that can be actually be used in 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 the, in in learning, so you make it more flexible, uh, in order to just uh, achieve your objectives that you want to achieve at the end of the day. So use uh, uh, videos, for instance. There are several videos that are actually useful. Make use of audios that are actually there. Uh, use text. Use images, and just also. I mean, just try to provide uh, learners with information in varieties of ways in that are more flexible instead of just sticking to the traditional way of, of teaching. So you need to introduce uh, uh, them to digital tools with support to meet their special learning needs and empower them to become more independent. Introduce them to some of the items that you can use in order to or pass on the message and to, to, to learn. And another one is to ask essential questions. Instead of teaching scripture uh, curriculums that are out there, uh, that are actually defined in textbook, consider putting uh, teaching uh, skills and expertise to better use uh, for actually during the, the uh, instructional. So you, apart from just uh, asking questions that are in your study guides. Uh, also just try to come up with some essential uh, uh, questions and this actually should require uh, learners to construct uh, and to construct knowledge and allow them to express their learning in their original ways. Just try to stimulate uh, learning apart from just the books. Just uh, give them some exercises that they can go out there and try to research on. And another one is to use brooms as a guide to develop complex questions instead of just using uh, 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 what is defined. Just try also to use brooms uh, for, for more uh, ways of developing complex questions like analyze, let them analyze, let them demonstrate, let them discuss and describe. So you need to, to, to use some of those uh, uh, brooms in order to actually uh, 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 create or stimulate that uh, uh, critical thinking in your in your students or learners. So with this, you'll be able, maybe asked to explain. You'll be maybe asked to list. Uh, or discuss how teachers can actually promote deep learning in, in, in lessons. You just need to go to that unit and uh, 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 look into the uh, these um, points that are actually uh, pointed out in uh, actually appearing in your slides. 
And then we are going to talk about effect of self-esteem on emotions and behaviors. And with, with this uh, uh, topic, I just want uh, you, you just have to uh, understand what self-esteem is and how the self-esteem actually affect emotions and, and behaviors. So the effect of, of self-esteem, you know how uh, uh, teenagers view themselves affect their emotions as a result is also affect their behaviors. There are people who actually have high self-esteem and those people with high self-esteem are actually more open to new ideas they are, uh, and values. They, are, they feel more in control of their life. You know, they are actually willing to render assistance if there is any assistance needed of, from them. They are actually willing to do volunteer works. But then when it comes to people with low self-esteem, they, they actually develop, uh, they are actually more prone to develop a feeling of isolation and loneliness. They struggle to make conversations with other people. They don't want to get involved in activities. They feel tense and awkward in social situations. Therefore, uh, they tend to be more withdrawn. They withdraw themselves from or social uh, activities or social events and then they don't even partake into activities in school they don't vo volunteer for any of the work or even if you are there you asking Christ uh, who is willing to volunteer to take um, keep time maybe of certain activities that you are doing or some of the the whatever you are activities you are, you are doing in class, they tend to just withdraw and stay in their little corners, not very much uh, involved in, in activities that are actually uh, going on. So th that actually, uh, those are actually uh, some of, of the factors that actually influences in, uh, affect the emotions and behavior of, of, of your learners. So, and adolescents, you know, they tend to compare themselves with their peers. They looking at their competence, what they are able to do, and and in this uh, at these sections, I also want you to look at some of the factors that actually influences uh, self esteem. So, social comparisons, for instance, personal achievements, peer relationship, athletic capabilities. So, look at some of the the factors that actually influence the self esteem or of 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 learners what are those factors you need to be able to list those factors you should also then be able to elucidate on how uh, uh, self-esteem uh, actually affect emotions and behavior so the effect of self-esteem on em emotions and behavior you should be able to actually elucidate on that and looking into higher self-esteem and as well as low self-esteem so how does that influences the emotions and behavior of 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 learners so and then we are quickly going to discuss on peer pressure and subsistence abuse uh, here you know you need to actually be able to define what peer pressure is uh, you know peers are people who are part of of the same social group so the term peer pressure actually means the influence that peers can have on each other so uh, peer pressure can have both a positive and negative, uh, 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 there are actually positive and negative consequences when it comes to peer pressure. So you need to understand, uh, you need to be able to analyze the positive uh, peer pressure as well as the negative uh, peer pressure. The negative peer pressures is when the group, uh, I mean, those actually uh, result into unhealth uh, 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 or destructive behaviors. For instance, theft and uh, the issue of subsistence uh, uh, alcohol abuse. So that is one part of of, of uh, negative peer pressure, and uh, it can also result into in engagements of uh, or sexual behavior and health sexual behavior. Uh, people with negative with I mean, in case of negative peer pressure, it can also result in. Um, in some, just some overall in destructive behaviors, uh, like people who end up even being reckless when it comes to driving, you know, 
uh, all these are actually, uh, all these uh, can be actually an issue or due to peer pressure. But peer pressure, not all or pressure, I mean, this uh, is actually negative. Uh, um, not all peer pressures uh, is bad. There are also positive peer pressure. Uh, the positive ones actually, uh, for instance, uh, when a person is encouraged to to do very well in, in class uh, because of their peers that are actually encouraging them to to do very well. Or maybe behavior at home, they are well behaved and this can also come out of, of, of the peers that they are actually associated with in, in the group. So all in all, just uh, know that uh, when it comes to peer pressure, you should be able to analyze uh, the uh, positive as well as the negative effects of, of peer pressure. And then uh, it also comes to how to deal with or to deal or assist peer pressure, you know, uh, that uh, teenagers uh, they are now in groups it's it can be very challenging for them to resist uh, peer pressure but you know as as teachers and as parents we need to educate uh, 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 learners and also just to guide them uh, with their choices by teaching them uh, and uh, about the, the 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 issues that they are, they are actually facing, and about problem solvings, and and as well as communicating skill, communication skills, and as well as uh, making choices. You need to to ed educate learners about the pros and cons of some of the the, the activities that they may in be involved in, and just show them that uh, tell them talk to them on issues of uh, alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, and issues of uh, el uh, on sex and uh, um, fast cars. All these issues that teenagers actually are, uh, are faced with. Just talk to them, educate them, and show them that uh, they have a choice, yeah? They can say no if they are not um, uh, not uh, willing to partake into any activities, for instance, when it comes to peer pressure, and uh, just uh, teach them how to say no politely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, those are some of the things that they need to actually just stand up and uh, face their fears, face their peers, and tell them what is good, what is not uh, good for them. So, in, all in all, they need to set boundaries that. As far as I am concerned, this is what is going to be done. This is what is going to be ha to to happen, and this is where uh, the boundary is, is. I won't cross that far and don't cross this uh, on my territory. Just make sure that they understand that they can actually uh, set their their boundaries, and they should be able to communicate their boundaries uh, assertively. In communicating their boundaries uh, assertively, there are actually steps that may help them to communicate boundaries assertively, and those are the uh, some of the points that are actually highlighted on the slides. Tell them to acknowledge their rights. Uh, they acknowledging your rights without ignoring the rights of other people, and also to, uh, tell them to have respect of themselves. And then they also have to show respect to other people, and they should be able to listen and talk. And when they are talking or passing on or communicating their their boundaries, they need to do it politely and and. Uh, also confidently, so they need to be uh, to to be able to actually uh, express uh, positive and negative feelings. Like when you are communicating, I don't want to do this because of A and B, and this I am not going to do because of A and B. So let teach them how to express these positive and negative feelings and how just to communicate their their boundaries uh, assertively. And they need also to be confident uh, and. Being confident, it doesn't mean uh, being uh, arrogant. So they should be confident, they should respect other people, they should just acknowledge their own rights without ignoring the rights of others, and then they must understand that they have rights to say, to say no. 
Apart from uh, peer pressure in terms of the negative and positive effects of peer pressure and how to resist peer pressure and how they can communicate boundaries assertively, I also want us to discuss the issue of subsistence abuse. And on the issue of subsistence abuse, I want us to look at the the reasons why people actually use alcohol. There are several reasons that out there that uh, uh, are given when people are using alcohol. So why do they use alcohol? They want to relieve stress. So that's one of the reasons why people uh, uh, actually uh, are use alcohol. They probably want to get uh, more self-confidence you know, uh, they feel more confident when they, they are under the influence or when they, are, they have taken in some alcohol, they are more confident. And maybe it's just because of uh, the, they want to fit within a certain group, yeah? And the, uh, maybe they prefer to be in that group and because of that, maybe that group actually drinks and then they have to drink because of, of that uh, uh, issue and sometimes they just temporarily want to escape from the overwhelming issues that are going on or skim senses of problems they don't want to face their problems then they go drink so that they can actually and you know it's within a short time that you actually escape from from these problems they just want to actually escape from that they actually just also because maybe the alcohol is available you go to an event a wedding or whatsoever and there's alcohol so they can actually maybe drink because of the availability of alcohol in on in those social setups because of it can also be because of boredom they are bored and they also just want to consume alcohol all in all what i'm saying is that under this alcohol and subsistence abuse you should be able to actually highlight the reasons why people use alcohol and you must uh, um, highlight the impact of alcohol on human health, relationship, as well as uh, uh, in life in general. For instance, when it comes to health, uh, it has uh, effect on, uh, it can result into respiratory problems. It can also, like for instance, in terms of smoking, it can result in, like for instance, nicotine can have issues with uh, nicotine constraints, the blood flow to the brain. The smoking can also result in cancer, like for instance, for the lung, throat, and lips. And then um, drugs can also lead to malnutrition. And, um, all this is, uh, can, uh, I mean, one of the other health issues is HIV and AIDS. And uh, for learners who are under the influence or who use alcohol, abuse alcohol, they also uh, then result in school dropout or maybe just failure or like because they are making wrong decisions, they're not able to go to school, they're not able to concentrate in class, they won't be able to perform or do their assignments or tests or activities that they are given. So, and alcohol can actually uh, damage relationships, it can result to divorce, uh, and it results into higher risk behaviors such as driving uh, or when the people are driving under the influence of alcohol can actually result into accidents. And also under, when you're under the influence of alcohol, you can engage in unsafe or sexual activities that can actually result in um, unwanted pregnancies as well as sexual transmitted diseases and HIV. All in all, I just want you to actually be able to discuss uh, the issue on sexual, uh, on alcohol and, and that. And I also want you to look at how a school can actually assist in prevention of, of, uh, of uh, drugs and, and abuse of alcohol by learners. So as a teacher, how do you help learners uh, from uh, dealing with, uh, um, with um, uh, alcohol abuse? So you need to to know how you can actually help students uh, with this issue. So, and dealing with emotions, emotion can be 
experience as positive and also negative emotions in under this topic uh, or unit i want you to be able to discuss the managing of emotions uh, uh, teachers need to have uh, teachers have to be sensitive on how le learners actually ex or learners emotions to be sensitive to learners' emotions and foster relationships of understanding and acceptance. So as a teacher, you need to educate learners on how to manage emotions and the importance of managing emotions. Why is it important to manage emotions? Because in this case, we are talking about emotional intelligence. So how you react to emotions, how do you uh, cope with emotions, you need uh, to, your learners need to understand how to actually cope with emotion or how to deal with emotions. Teachers can actually help adolescents to handle their emotions by letting them verbalize their emotions. Let them talk about it, display a sense of humor, and be supportive and provide them with the opportunity to cry. I mean, uh, a lot of times we say uh, men don't cry. If if a person wants to express uh, their their emotions in crying, let them be. Let provide them the opportunity to cry if they want to do so. Also provide them an opportunity to release pain emotions through physical activities like sport activities and so forth. You let them let them do that. So you need uh, those are some of the ways that actually teachers can actually help adolescents to handle their emotions. So it's it's not good to sus suppress emotions. Let them uh, relieve or express their actually emotions without uh, being forced to actually suppress them. And now I want us to look at the independence of uh, animal and plant. Animal and plants are actually dependent on each other. They have that uh, mutual relationship, or there is a mutual relationship uh, uh, or beneficial relationship between animal and plants. So in this case, um, uh, plants and uh, and animals depend on each other in in many ways. For instance, they depend on each other for food. They depend on each other for exchange of gases, for reproduction, for instance, pollination, and they also then depend on on each other for like for instance shelter. So under this, uh, uh, um, apart from just be able to discuss how the this uh, independence relationship or this independence of of uh, of animal and plants, I would also like you to uh, take time to read on photosynthesis. So plants make their own food. So this uh, take time to go through the, the topic on photosynthesis. Try to understand the process or be able to analyze the process of photosynthesis in plants. And you also need to uh, get the, the equations of, of, of photosynthesis. And I also want you to look at uh, food chain, yeah? Food chain and food web. So, and in this, uh, you may be asked to actually provide an example of, of, of food chain or an example of a food web. These are actually a very easy topic, but when it comes to exam, uh, sometimes people don't really uh, give proper examples when it's, it comes to this topic. So, just try to make time and go through the food chain as well as the food web and try to understand the differences between uh, uh, the food chain as well as uh, the food web. So, and um, then uh, we'd like us to look at the classification of, anim or, uh, of animals. Uh, scientists actually look at certain similarities in uh, characteristics first before considering the characteristic of other or, 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 or characteristic of the animal when they are actually classifying these organisms into groups. So the the under this topic, I just want you to be able to actually uh, um, uh, be able to discuss how uh, organisms or animal are actually classified into groups. What did 
uh, what are the criteria that are actually used uh, by scientists to classify these animals? They first look at the backbones, whether the animal has a backbone or it doesn't have the uh, backbones. Then they look at how the body parts of an animal are organized or are arranged. So after all, they again look at the internal features and external features of, of, of the organism or of the animal. Organisms that are related to each other have actually similar internal structures that actually allows them to live, to grow, to survive, and to actually reproduce. They also have uh, external similarities. So scientists actually look at these uh, uh, features and then they categorize them into different groups depending on their similarities. They also look at uh, behaviors uh, and behavioral patterns is what uh, when they are actually uh, the one type of behavior that scientists actually use uh, is actually what does the organisms eat. So they are classified into herbivores, uh, carnivores, as well as the omnivores. So and uh, I guess you should understand what are the carnivores, what are the herbivores, and what are the omnivores. You need to understand those. So, and this is the, actually how the body parts are actually arranged. The asymmetrical, the ones that the body pair parts uh, do not have um, an ordinary uh, body print like the sponge. And then you have the lateral symmetry uh, where both by the body parts can be arranged in a secular, um, in a cycle around the central, like the stuff is that you can see there. And then the bilateral asymmetry where the body parts contain two similar halves. That means you can literally cut in the middle and one part will look like the other part of, 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 of the organism. So, yeah, so you need to understand the criteria that uh, the scientists used to classify these uh, organisms, and you should be able to uh, highlight. Uh, you may be as a, you may be asked to discuss them. You may be asked to differentiate between uh, the asymmetries, the asymmetries, or how the body part are uh, actually uh, uh, arranged. And maybe you'll be asked to define uh, or to do differentiate between carnivores and omnivores or carnivores and herbivores. So go into that unit and also pay, just pay attention to, to that uh, uh, topic. And then uh, we are actually looking, uh, due to time, we are actually also just going to rush through the distillations and it, its application in, the, in, the, in, the, in different industry. And with this topic, um, um, you need to be able to define what distillation is. You should be able to define what that is. And, um, and you should be able to actually um, show, for instance, to discuss or describe how to separate water from insoluble impurities by distillation. So you should be able to uh, actually uh, discuss the process of distillation, uh, which is in terms of or distilling water is actually a method of purifying water involving heat. So as you can see in, in the graph that is uh, here, so you should be able to actually discuss the process and also mention the, the instruments or the tools or the apparatus that are actually involved in the distillation. And for instance, if you are in a lab and you just want to demonstrate this to students, you should be able to know what uh, apparatus do you need or equipment do you need and how you carry out this uh, process successfully. And you should be able then to describe to describe this. And there are times also in the past exams that we actually ask them or students uh, to actually just label the diagram. So I'll put a diagram and I'll say maybe label what A is and what is actually used for. So that's as far as distillation is concerned, as in the terms of, uh, as in process. And then there are also applications of distillation in different industries. Here, I just want you to, most of the times I will ask maybe for you to um, 
mission where this uh, uh, distillation is actually applied when it comes to production of alcohol, maybe when it comes to uh, production of distilled water and so forth and so forth, you just need to actually uh, be able to list or mention some or where this uh, process can actually be applied. And the uh, picture above is actually just highlighting some of the apparatus that are actually uh, used in the lab. So, and we do have an issue, uh, another unit is on uh, water, uh, wind, and air, and their pollutions. Here, you, in case of water, I want you to be able to give the basic properties of water. So, under, um, uh, you need to give the basic properties of water. At room temperature, water is actually tasteless, it's actually odorless, and is colorless with a hint of blue, and is actually used, uh, known as a common uni or universal solvent. So here, know the basic properties of water, know the phases of water cycle. You need to know the liquid phase, the solid phase, the gas phase, phase and you also need to actually understand the water cycle and uh, all the phases of water cycle uh, uh, like for instance evaporation, transpiration, I mean yeah, transpiration, condensation, precipitations and corrections. As you can see in the graph here, you need to understand the water cycle. So I'm asking you to look at the water cycle and also to look at the sources of, of, of water pollution and how you can purify water. There are some techniques out there that can be used to purify water, like for instance, iodine, chlorine, uh, by just filtering water filters, by boiling as well as the distillation that we just talked about. So just know the sources of water pollution uh, uh, and also the ways where you can purify the water to make it drinkable. And then when it comes to wind, I want you to be able to discuss the benefits of wind. What are the benefits of wind? Uh, and you also want you to be able to uh, discuss the distinct dangers of hurricane and tornadoes and also the sources of air pollution like burning of fossil fuel, agricultural activities, the exhaust from factories, industry and mining operations. So you need to discuss and you need to be able to define those. And when it comes to wildlife, um, it's, it's also a unit that discusses on wildlife. Uh, here I just want you to be able to discuss the importance of wildlife. Why is it important? They are obviously economic importance, they are nutritional values, ecological roles, and they can be used in research and they are also used in conservation of biological diversities as well as it's good for social uh, uh, cultural, uh, they are also there for social cultural significance. So you might be asked to write an essay on the importance of wildlife, so you should be able to, that, to do that. Just point out uh, some of those points and elaborate on those. So uh, go back to your notes uh, and research on on those factors. And then the issue of endangered species. So these are actually uh, native species that actually face significant risk of extinction. And you should just be able to define what it is and mention some of the uh, species that are actually endangered in Namibia. So, and there we are also, you are also expected to know how to care for animals in captivity as well as at home. So how do you care for animals in captivity? captivity as well as at home. What are those factors that you need to, or to, to actually take into account? And then that also comes to animal welfare. You need to understand what the natural behavior of the animal, what does the animal need in terms of temperature and in terms of food. So and you need to understand those factors as well. So, and then we do have a unit on impact of human activities on the ecosystem. You know, you want to, I mean, I expect you to be able to list some of these human activities that actually influence the, economy, the ecosystem negatively when they are performed in an excessive and unsustainable way. For instance, there's agriculture, industries, mining and fishing. So you need to understand how these activities actually influence the, the environment negatively. And 
Also then, if you know those activities and how they influence the uh, environment or ecosystem negatively, and then I will expect you also to be able to know how to prevent destruction, the destruction of habitat and also to preserve biodiversity. How can you uh, prevent the destruction and habitat and also preserve biodiversity? You should be able to mention some of those factors that are actually appearing in the slide and also elaborate on, on, on them. So like reduce or eliminate the use of household chemicals and pesticides, recycle of waste uh, as much as you can, reduce the amount of waste that you produce, reduce your carbon footprint, and choose food that are actually grown uh, 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 locally and grown sustainably. We are talking about uh, buying food that are actually grown locally. So go out there and support local products. And then there is also a part on um, actually a uh, circulatory system. And with this section, I just want you to be able to mention some of the parts of the circulatory system and also be able to know the functions of or the parts, the four chambers, and actually be able to explain their, their functions, what is their functions. And from there, I'll ask you again to look at the if issue of smoking and lungs. How does smoking hurt the lungs? It destroys the tiny hair, or, 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 and then which actually lines up uh, or the airways and protect it against the against infections. So you need to actually uh, take time and discuss, uh, find out how this, it's actually available in your notes. So discuss how smoking actually hurt the lungs. It destroys the uh, tiny hairs. It can destroy the alveoles. That is the air sac of the lungs. It can also reduce the ability of the alveoli to actually stretch. It can cause lung cancers. It also uh, has an issue or general issue on or, or just general health problems that are actually related to smoking. And then you should also be able to discuss the signs of lung damage from smoking. And as you can see on your slides, there is actually a uh, 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 part of the lung that is actually uh, damaged and then the part of the lung that is healthy. So you should be able to actually look at that. And because of time, I cannot elucidate in each of the points, but I'm actually giving you an idea of what to actually, uh, how to prepare for your exam and how to be able to handle your questions when you are asked uh, some of these uh, uh, questions. So otherwise, thank you very much uh, for, for your time uh, to listen to this session. And I wish you all the best for your exam. And uh, don't hesitate to contact me to that number in case you have questions. And you are also welcome to send me an email. And I already um, gave my email at the beginning of the session. That is actually tautiko at gmail.com. Reach out if you have questions. And I wish you all the best for your exam. Thank you very much.